Great to be here today. We've had a wild couple of weeks, and uh, as you know, we had to go um, online only for a couple week period because we had several staff members, including myself, that were diagnosed with uh, COVID. So that kind of brought some things to a shrieking halt for a few days as we went through the processes that the government's asking us to do. We did that. And by the way, uh, we had our whole staff tested. Uh, most everybody's coming up negative, but just wanted you to know that we're going to uh, start again with uh, in-person services next Sunday. So thank you for joining with us today. I'm feeling great. Cindy's feeling great. We're all on the mend and, uh, and doing really good. So uh, turn with me, if you could, to John chapter 14. I'm starting a new series called The Turning, and I... <laughs> I, uh, I'm not good with titles, but the turning is really a call for all of us during this month leading up to the elections. I really believe the election is a key <clears throat> pivotal moment in our history, possibly as a country. You know, I hear a lot of it on TV. This is the first time, most serious time. I, I, I don't really know. I, I, haven't lived, I haven't lived that long to be able to make that judgment. I do know a little bit about history, but it is a very challenging time, for sure. 2020 has dealt a hand to us that is very different than what most of us probably anticipated, and many people can't wait for it to be over. I'm not sure there's anything magical that's going to happen on December 31st, but I understand what you're feeling. We're trying to reach out to everybody and keep you encouraged. John 14, verse 16, the turning, and I want to talk about the alternative to chaos. <clears throat> you know, there's... There's really a choice in the midst of all this that we're going through. And, and I've seen it in my own life. You can be governed by fear and governed by the difficulties of the moment, what you're seeing on news media or seeing on the internet and the memes that are out there, or, or you can be steadfast in your soul. It's one of the challenges I have with the American church, really the Western church as a whole, is that I think we've not taken the undergirding of our soul seriously in recent decades. And as a result, the wave of this coming back, we've had numerous warnings along the way, you know, including 9-11, stock market uh, blow up, in, uh, or the housing market blow up in 08, 09. I mean, we've had numerous warnings to us to, to get yourself girded. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9 that, the government is upon his shoulders, upon Jesus' shoulders. So we learn to rest in him. I know I, I've had my moments too where I'm a little anxious and I think, wow. I mean, when I was diagnosed with COVID and I got positive test results, it's like, oh boy. You know, and I, I, you know, you don't know where you're going. We've heard all these horror stories and no doubt there's been a lot of horror stories. 200,000 people supposedly have died of COVID over the past six or seven months. And so you look at that, you go into it, but I had, to, I had to latch my soul once again on Psalm 23 and say, if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. And you know what? That's been sustaining me now for a long time. I think since I was about four years old. But anyway, having a verse that you can go back to, having something you can anchor yourself to in what God has said will really carry you through. And so these moments, you learn how to understand what the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church today. If you go to Revelations, you see that, you know, it's seven different times the Bible says in Revelation, to him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church. That's the called out ones, the ecclesia. That's each one of you that have given your heart to Jesus Christ and you're in a collective relationship, doing life together with other people, that is the church. That you're changing and transforming your neighborhood, your area that you live in. That your church is seeking to train and equip people and reaching out to the lost. That is the church that Jesus dreamed about. That is feeding the poor. That is the church that Jesus dreamed about. And he called all of us out. And those people are to hear the Spirit of God. So I spent the second half of this summer talking about being walking in the Spirit. And I'm continuing with a little bit different view during this month leading up to the election. And so I want to talk about today learning to commune in the Holy Spirit. It's part of the turning back to Jesus, which we're calling our entire nation to. 
learning to commune with the Holy Spirit. Look at John 14, 16. Jesus says this, listen, this is Jesus speaking. <laughs> you gotta believe it. And I will pray the Father, pray to the Father that he will give you another helper. He's referencing the Holy Spirit here. That he may abide. Say that out loud wherever you are right now, abide. Yeah, that he may abide. That means in the Greek, the original language, a close, standing close beside with change in mind. Well, that's interesting. Abiding means you're, you're abiding with the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you and you with him. It says forever. In other words, you would cling together for the purpose of individual change. The Holy Spirit wants to change you, wants to transform you. And so you learn to commune with him. I got to admit, I mean, I've always known about the Holy Spirit since I was a little boy, but he, he's just so hard to picture. I, you know, I've, I understand the Father. I understand what I believe the Father God to be. I mean, I should say I'm continually learning. You know, he is the God, the Father of all. He's the one that so loved the world he gave, his only begotten son. So Jesus comes into play out of the Father's love. He's sent to earth, Father's Son, Holy Spirit. But in Jesus Christ, Jesus, it says in the Bible, that I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Father gave the Son, the Son gave the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit covers the entire world. The Holy Spirit is universal. The Bible describes him like the wind. I mean, you don't know where he comes from, you don't know where he's going. There's this powerful move of the Spirit of God, just like Jesus, just like the Father, the Holy Spirit. There's nothing wrong with communing with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, I'm going to send the helper that he may abide with you forever. Are you abiding in the Holy Spirit? So I don't even know what that means. Then you're probably not abiding with the Holy Spirit. When you abide with the Holy Spirit, you are clinging to the Holy Spirit. You are learning of the ways and you are discovering more about Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit is all about, I mean, his number one job description is to reveal Jesus Christ. In other words, your time in the Spirit, even during worship this morning, I, I just came and we're filled in a room with about six, seven, eight people. I don't know, our worship band and a few others. And uh, because we're shut down this week and we're starting back next week in live services. So in here, I mean, it's just kind of us and God, you know, and I was just expecting, okay, it's going to be great. We're going to go hear some amazing worship, see what happens. But I mean, on the first song, boom, the Holy Spirit shows up in this room as he does every Sunday. The presence of God is strong in the room. I can feel the Holy Spirit. And in that time, you commune, you communicate with the Holy Spirit. I tell him, I say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come change me. I know that's what you're here for. Transform me. Reveal Jesus in me. Because when I see Jesus, I understand who I am. I understand what he did. I understand what my destiny is and who my, what my identity is. All of that gets revealed in Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus is the Spirit a prophecy. I mean, when you talk about Jesus, when you commune with Jesus, the whole future opens up to you. I love what the Holy Spirit does. He's got all the keys and he's constantly unlocking new understanding in Jesus Christ. So Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would come. You know, this past week I had a dream. It was an interesting week. Maybe I'll share more of it next week. But I had this dream, and the only way I can describe it and be brief <laughs> is that it was a dream that I, I don't know, I've never had before. And it took me back into my past about 40 years at Bible college when I was at Bible school back in 19, I don't know, 76, 77, 78, that bracket. And I went back and I've got great memories of Bible school, made great friends, you know, I mean, it was a good experience. I learned a lot about the Bible. I mainly made amazing relationships there, including my wife. And so that, that was well worth it. And, uh, but, but I dreamed the other night and I was back there, but it wasn't the school I went to. It was way better. <laughs> I'm talking about the physical look of the school. I mean, they even had a train that took you from one side of the campus to the other. I mean, we only had about 1,000 students in our school. So this is obviously a dream. In a dream, many things can happen. Some are literal, some are symbolic, and you learn how to interpret that from the Holy Spirit. I do believe in dreams, though. I believe in revelation from the Lord, and I know the difference between a pizza dream and a Holy Spirit dream. <laughs> this was a Holy Spirit dream. And in the dream, everything was working out in my favor. I don't know if you've been to university or college or whatever. One of the great fears 
In high school, your great fear is that you're going to forget your locker combination. That's a 1970s fear. You know, but in college and seminary, you have concerns and fears that you're going to get the right qu- the classes. What are the classes going to be like? Are you going to remember to go to them? Are you, remember, are you going to be able to do what you need to do? But in this dream, in the, it was the beginning of the school year, there was nothing but favor attached to this dream. I mean, it was kind of funny in a way. It gave me a feel of what absolute favor feels like in that environment. I mean, I had no worries at all. In fact, I knew that I could take my time and I would not be late for class regardless of how much time I took. Well, that's crazy. That's not, that's not natural. We're confined by time. But I had, that, I had that sense like there's no worries. I mean, I got all the classes that I wanted. Every class I asked for, I got in this dream. And I looked at my phone. Of course, I didn't have cell phones back in the 1970s, but hey, in the dream, you can do anything. And I looked at my phone, and it was auto-populating, automatically populating all of my classes onto my phone. I saw it happen right in front of me. It was so easy to schedule to be there. And I'm sitting there, and I see this beautiful uh, young lady next to me who turned out to be my wife, Cindy, and some dude on the other side came over and sat down between my wife and I. And I remember as clear as a bell, I just went and took him by the shirt and, and kind of pulled him back to the other side and went back and sat where my wife was. Like every normal conflict just had easy resolution and favor upon it. And the big favor on that is the, is the dude didn't stand up and resist me. He just stayed on the other side because I was claiming this woman as my wife, 1970s type stalking, you know, and anyway, uh, so I did that, and, and then I heard that Chris Conley, who used to be with us on staff here, he's now in Memphis, Tennessee, that he had just been appointed as the, the president of the school, and I thought, this is great, I know Chris, you know, and so I'm thinking, all this favor stuff, I could go on, 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 it was just like, I even witnessed to people that were non-Christians, they began to weep, they received Jesus Christ, it was one of those times, and right in the midst of this amazing, favorable moment, I hear, it's my phone not in the dream in real life and so it took me out of the dream and I woke up like oh I mean there was one of the dreams like Lord could I live there for a while in that dream that's just amazing you know and so I looked at my phone and it was from a friend of mine I thought oh you know it was actually a little later in the morning because I was recovering from COVID I was really tired you know and I I looked at looked at my phone and it said uh, my friend was sending me a free uh, invite to a Wealth with God event. I mean, it was, it was, that took me out. It was like the Lord was bringing me out of the dream into the present with a promise of something free that would create wealth. And I thought, this is just a picture of God. When that happens in my life, I always know that whatever my daily reading is in the Bible, I read this through this book that gives you portions of the Bible every day. I knew that my daily reading would contain something to affirm what I just experienced. Now, if you don't experience these kinds of things, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I think Holy Spirit is way more involved in your life than you probably know. And if you will stop and begin to commune and recognize, and I don't always do this, but sometimes I hit it. Commune with the Holy Spirit, you realize Holy Spirit, you are working in and out of my life on a continuous basis. And so sure enough, I opened my reading for the day. It was in Philippians chapter 2, and it said this. It said, therefore, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. This is confirmation of my dream. Now, this is a wild confirmation. You won't get it. Uh, Interpretations sometimes are like that. They don't directly apply. But to the person, it's like, yeah, that's that's what God was speaking to me. Verse 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, Paul speaking, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, I read that, and the reason it hit me is I, this fellowship of the Spirit, I'm sure I've read it many times in my life, but because of things that have been going on in my life, I was drawn to it. Has that ever happened to you? You're kind of drawn like, wait, 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 what does that mean, fellowship of the Spirit? It literally means it's the word koinonia, which is communion, community, fellowship, friendship. So Paul is saying here, if there's any consolation of Christ, any comfort and love, any koinonia or communion of the Spirit, fulfill my joy by being, in other words, this communion of the Spirit brings like-mindedness, 
same love, one accord, one mind. Now, the reason it hit me is just a couple days before, over in the Second Corinthians, my daily reading took me to a similar phrase. Only in some brief study did I realize these are two spots that the Lord was highlighting to me. The only place that they occur in the New Testament where it speaks of this communion with the Holy Spirit. And that communion with the Holy Spirit brings sameness, brings oneness, brings a unity of heart, brings a stillness of mind. When Jesus was promising the Holy Spirit, it was because he wanted us to get it together. That the Holy Spirit would bring a communion, a commonality between us and God. That the Holy Spirit would move through our lives on a daily basis, on, a, on an hourly basis, on a minute by minute basis. I anticipate the Holy Spirit now when I go a place. I think, okay, what are you doing? You know, communing with him. What are we going to do? Is there anything I need to do here? What's on your mind today? In 2 Corinthians, the second verse I want to read to you on this says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. This is verse 11. Be of one mind. You get this? Be complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, except for 2020, just letting you know that. All the saints greet you, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, amen. The communion of the Holy Spirit is related to oneness and peace. If you feel peace is being disturbed in your life, I've got, I've got a remedy for you. <laughs> Try it out. Commune with the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? It looks the same as walking with Jesus in the cool of the day. You recognize when you're with someone and you relate with them, you call them out by name. So I go, Holy Spirit. I've been practicing this a long time ever since I read Benny Hinn's, ben, Benny Hinn's book back in the, I don't know, 1980s or whenever, Good Morning Holy Spirit. It was, the, it was the first book in a long time in charismatic circles that really addressed the relationship of one person toward the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we don't think about it. We come, we pray in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son. We forget, though, sometimes the Holy Spirit, that we can commune and talk with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, help me in this moment. Holy Spirit, help me with this business deal. I was playing golf with one of my coworkers, Jerry, <laughs> The other day, and I joked, I, I mean, I wasn't playing very well, so I, first thing came to my mind is Holy Spirit. I mean, I know it sounds trite, but I walked up to the tee and I, I held up my club and said, Holy Spirit, <laughs> I need you right now. <laughs> Touch this club. I'm surprised lightning didn't strike the club. But anyway, I got up there and hit a really good ball, but I, I'm going to do that now on every, on every hole. But anyway, there's this, there's this sense of the communing with the Holy Spirit in our daily walk. If your spirituality is attached to Sunday morning only, you have bought something that possibly is a religious spirit. Now I say that with all respect because I've, I've done that. I've religiously just kind of gone to church rather than recognizing that God's called me in a community of believers, that he wants to speak to me individually through that community of believers. And I come here in particular on Sundays to get charged up to get informed and understanding, to experience the presence of God uniquely comes when you get hundreds of people gathering together. There's, there's a, an intensification of the power that is released in a group of people worshiping God. And as you learn to love one another, the Holy Spirit begins to work through you and transform you into the very image of Jesus Christ. And so you come to that place. But here's what I'm finding about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you in your major decisions in life. Uh, my dad, who, you know, didn't come to know Jesus Christ until he was, uh, until I was 19. So it was kind of later in his life. I think he was 47 years old. And uh, I'll never forget, for a while he was doing real estate. He was learning real estate. He's transitioning. He was retired, actually. And he was going to own a bunch of properties and, and rent those out and so forth. So he, he got into real estate so that he could learn the ins and outs of everything that happens. And, and when he would close a deal, I re, I'm, I've been with him when it happened because I was one of them. I bought a house and he was my realtor. And when we come down to signing the documents, he had the documents there. And he would tell a person, say, look, 
I, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you mind if I bless this agreement? And I watched as people that maybe had no clue about God, no understanding, but they were reverent enough to say, hey, I'm making a major decision. I would like some kind of a priest or someone to bless this. And he would lay hands on it. He'd have them lay hands on it too. Now, everything he did was evangelistic. And so as he's praying over the contract, he's also thanking God for the contract that he made with us through Jesus Christ shed blood. So he's communicating in his prayer to them. He's, he's winning them. Lord, many of them came to the Lord as a result of it. But I saw from them, I thought, that's brilliant. It's brilliant just to bring the Holy Spirit into your daily events, your business deals, the car you're trying to buy. The house. I, know, I know there's Christians out there saying, God doesn't have time for all that. Oh, he does. He does. I mean, he may be dealing with things in Afghanistan and Pakistan and India and Europe and other places around the world, but you have a limited God if you think that he doesn't know everything that's going on in your life. But the Holy Spirit was released so that he could flood the world, that he could empower you, he could reveal Jesus Christ to you so you could be transformed, so you could be changed into what? Into the image of Jesus Christ. We want millions of Christians, billions of Christians walking around this planet carrying the presence and power and understanding of Jesus Christ. You say, but we're just earthen vessels. I know that. The Bible talks about it. But I'm telling you, there's something eternal that is inside this earthen vessel. And when that eternal part of who you are, led by the Holy Spirit of God, gets released into the streets, it's got to be a daily, hourly, minute-by-minute -minute relationship. Otherwise, you will miss key turns. Even when we got COVID on our staff, a few staff people got COVID, immediately we had to make a decision. I went to the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, guide me in this decision. I talked with Jerry about it. A few of us talked about it. Their feeling was we shut down for two weeks. We nuked this thing. We respray our buildings with whatever they spray it with, you know, to make sure COVID's dead. And then we come back together. And I, and, and, and I went back to my office and I was thinking about it. I think about this a lot. I'm a big guy on direction and decisions. It's, I wrote a book on it, you know, so I just really think about those kinds of things. And I went back and I said, Holy Spirit, how does this work? And I started, I thought of five things I'm going to give you really quick. But number one, when Israel came out of Egypt, this is what communion with the Holy Spirit is all about. When Israel came out of Egypt, which becomes the, the overarching template of the Bible, that they were in bondage, Egypt in that case represents sin. They were bound by sin. The Lord delivered them by dealing with Pharaoh. And the Lord had them released out into the wilderness to begin to move toward the promises of God which is called the promised land in the Bible. And we know that when they went through the waters of the Sea of Galilee and they parted, all of you have seen a movie about that or something, that that is a picture of water baptism. It's clarified in the New Testament. So the life that they lived, the wandering they did, the mistakes they made, in the Bible it says they serve as an example for us. So we learn from this journey of Jewish people in the Old Testament, working their way toward the promises of God. Does that sound familiar? Yes. They were led by a cloud by day and a fire by night. Guess who that is? Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit, he lights up in darkness. He brings the cloud of shadiness in the hot days. And so they're coming out, and what does God do? God, they have this short journey to the promised land. God takes them a different way. And he even explains why he takes them a different way. And this is interesting because sometimes you just say, even in our culture now, well, you just need to do this. And this is what's faith. If you wear a mask, that's, that's moving in faith. If you don't wear a mask, that's moving in faith. I mean, everybody's got these little subset arguments about everything we're facing right now. If you vote for Biden, that's in faith. If you vote for Trump, that's in faith. I mean, we, we've created all these things and it's created a huge division rather than us transcending the situation and saying, look, Regardless of what, I'm going to do what I can do in this realm. But regardless of what happens, I'm being led of the Spirit of God. And let me tell you, the Spirit of God does not always take you where you think you should go. Did you know He knows more than you know? I mean, you may have the perfect God. This is my forever house. I love it. I can't wait. To, and you feel this check in your spirit. You know what that is? 
That's Christianese. <laughs> it's a language for, I feel this thing inside, I can't explain it. Christians feel it all the time because the Holy Spirit dwells in them. And the Holy Spirit's like, ooh, he's tapping the brake. And you're feeling the brake pads of your soul. And you're like, whoa, what is that? I, I, no, no, Holy Spirit, this is a good deal. Holy Spirit, have you ever bought a house? No, this is what I'm going to do. And then you do that and you realize there's a major leak in the roof and, and you didn't know that. And then you, you know, that's what happens. Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. You get with somebody and think, this is the person I want to marry. And then you feel really good about it. That's the Holy Spirit. No, feeling good about it is not necessarily the Holy Spirit. There's a whole lot of factors in marrying someone that you're going to be with your entire life. I see people that have just flippantly married someone and then they, they wake up somewhere down the road and they're like, what in the world did I do? I, and then they say, I tried to follow you, God, and what I did. And then they get angry at God. God's like, I had nothing to do with this. I mean, the Holy Spirit is there. You say, he, he's concerned about those decisions. He, yeah, you got to learn to commune with him. You gotta learn to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So Israel, they take the long route. Why would God have them take the long route? Why not the short route? Why didn't Moses argue with him and say, Lord, I, I lived out here for 40 years. I mean, I know you've been all over the world. Maybe you don't know the geography here. <laughs> I do. And Lord, if we go this way, we're gonna be in the land of promise in probably 30 or 40 days. Carry these two million people over there, it'd be great. And the Lord says, no, I want you to go in the opposite direction and take a different route. Why? And then we find out in Scripture, and this is what's puzzling about the Holy Spirit and His ways. Because if they go in the short direction, they will face war. This is what God says. They will face war, and they might change their minds about trusting in God. So I'm gonna lead them out in the wilderness and train them and teach them how to follow the ways of God. You ever had God take you the long route? <laughs> I have, I have. And I, you know, and I argue with him. I go, Lord, this doesn't make sense. Lord, this is not the way that you get there. I know how to get to Pittsburgh. You get on the toll road on Ohio Turnpike, you drive two hours east and you're in Pittsburgh. Why are we heading to Columbus when our, when our destination is Pittsburgh? It's the Holy Spirit. He knows. He knows. Now, I read this and I go, well, why should, who cares if we face war? You're with us. You can defeat him. Isn't that a, a legitimate argument? If God be for me, who can be against me? I mean, Moses could have used Scripture to argue with God and say, we want to go the short path. But for whatever reason, in the midst of it, God avoids difficulty in order to give training in your soul. Let me just tell you, during this whole COVID thing, these people are being absolute this and this is what you should be doing and that's what you should be. I'm talking about Christians in the church. The Holy Spirit does not always choose the easy route. And sometimes the Holy Spirit actually calls us to move within the systems that are here on earth and not to resist them. And so I look at that and I think, okay, well, that's really interesting. Acts chapter 11. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but in Acts 11, there's a plot to kill Paul. So to avoid trouble, now think about this is Apostle Paul. Why should he be concerned about any disruption in the plan? Why did he not just say, look, I'm the Apostle Paul. And if it, I mean, Jesus, when Jesus was about to be thrown over the cliff, do you remember that story? The Bible just simply says, and he walked through the crowd and, and they didn't know where he was. <laughs> what does that look like? I mean, Jesus in the middle, oh, he could have like flown. Angels could have plucked him up, put him over the crowd that was about to, the, the fire God could come down and consume the entire crowd. We all have enough Old Testament examples to, to figure out what could have happened here. But Jesus just slips through the crowd. Why didn't he resist the crowd? Why did he come against them? He just slips through the crowd. I'm telling you, there's times during this COVID experience, during this election, we just need to slip through the crowd. Don't make a big deal out of it. We're being led of the Holy Spirit. I don't need to defend everything that I'm doing. I don't need to post something on the internet so everyone knows what I think. I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes you just kind of slip through the crowd. So what did Paul do? They put him in a basket and dropped him over the wall to avoid those who were trying to get him. You know what they'd say in the church today? They'd go, Paul, where's your faith? Why didn't you just stay there? They're not gonna be able to touch you. God, God's for you. He's not against you. 
Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. I mean, we could quote 10, 12 verses just like that. Come on, Paul, where's your faith? Somehow in Paul's mind, he's able to calculate this is not worth the battle right now. Just sent me over the wall. Is it because he's a coward? No, he's not a coward. We know that. Is it because he's afraid of the crowd? No. Is it because he lacks faith? No. There are people that are going to do certain things during this does not mean that they lack faith. And so when we close the meeting last week and this week, there's no lack of faith. There's a bigger picture here. We're looking at the bigger picture. Let's bring calm. Let's nuke this situation. Let's move on what God's called us to do because God's got some great things he wants to do in the greater Cleveland area. That's the way we're thinking through this major situation. Paul and Agabus, I'm going to give a few more because I think it's important. Agabus, a well-known prophet, comes up to Paul and takes off his belt and binds himself up. It's a prophetic picture. There are prophets that still do this. It's a little strange in our culture, but it happens. So it's like a, an illustrated prophecy. <laughs> Ezekiel had them. Isaiah had them. Jeremiah had them. Agabus in the New Testament, he binds himself up. He goes, Paul, this is what will happen to you. If you go back to Jerusalem, the Gentiles will seek you out. Now, what does Paul do? I mean, if that was me, I'd go, well, hey, we're going to change our plans right now. I'm not going out of Jerusalem. I'm not ready to die yet. But instead, Paul goes, hey, Now, he's going against a prophetic understanding from a known prophet. And he says, not only am I willing to be bound, but I'm willing to die. What? What is that? Now, Paul should be cautious, and he's overriding the prophetic word. How is that? Because he understands the Holy Spirit's with him. He's like, okay, what you are getting prophetically is a picture of what's going to happen. Thank you for the confirmation. But I am still going down to Jerusalem. Yes, I will be bound, and if necessary, and ultimately, he did die as a result of that by going over to Rome. So Paul knows Paul's being governed by the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Because he does it all through the New Testament. I mean, I love this. Look at Jesus. We're going to get back to Paul in a minute. Jesus at the wedding. You know, the famous time where he turned water into wine. Speaking of, drinking some water. Jesus at the wedding, and and Mary, his mom, comes up and says, Jesus, we need you to make wine. What does Jesus say? Now, I've, I've been puzzled with this my ever since I first read about it. But he says this, my hour has not come, mom. I'm throwing mom in there. My hour has not come. It's not right. This is not the way I want to enter into the ministry that, that the Father's called me into. Next thing we know, though, there's not really a lot said except that he turns the water into wine. When your mom asks you to do something, apparently that overrides everything else that God has put in your heart. And so he, he turns the water into wine. Why did he do that? Jesus actually went against what was interpreted to be his destiny to say, I will do this anyway. You're starting to get a feeling of what it is to be led of the Spirit of God. Jesus was led by the Spirit of God. Jesus knew there's times we press through, there's times we avoid. There's times we push through and we fight this situation. There's times when we back up and say, this is not a battle that I want to fight. Do you see the difference in that? And so finally, in Paul, uh, in Acts chapter 16, uh, I love this passage, Paul is finding his way through Asia Minor, a small part, uh, present-day Greece, Turkey, that, that whole area, actually more Greece, And uh, it says this in verse 6 of Acts 16. This is how he's led by the Holy Spirit. When they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, listen to this. I've always looked at this and thought, what? They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach. What? Holy Spirit wouldn't do that. That's the, the devil wouldn't want me to preach. Well, the Holy Spirit forbid him from preaching the word in Asia. The, the word there forbid means to pause and reflect. I mean, he, 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 he was, how did that happen? I don't know. But he's in tune enough with the Holy Spirit to get this is a pausing of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it, it's the natural thing to do, to go preach to Asia. I'm gonna go everywhere and preach the gospel. What is the Holy Spirit? What did he have in mind? What was he trying to keep me from avoiding? Okay, maybe this is the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to go there. So verse 7, 
After they came to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia. Look at this. So he tries out another city. This is the esteemed apostle who generally knows what he's doing, who he is, and what God's called him to. And so <clears throat> he gets over to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. What's again? Wait a minute. What's going on here? You can't go here. You can't go there. So passing by Mycenae, they came to Troas. Okay, how's he going to know? Where? He gets to the bottom part of Asia Minor. How does he know where he's going to go now? A vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man from Macedonia stood pleading with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. In other words, his direction comes by a Holy Spirit vision. After he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. This is like a commentary on what happened. Luke is writing this. He says, immediately after the vision, so the vision directed them. Immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So the Holy Spirit says no. He says no. They get a vision. Let's go. This is the life of the Holy Spirit. He's going to say no certain times and you're going to say that makes no sense. Why should I not take that million dollar offer that I'm getting? Because it's going to destroy your family. You just don't know it yet. I'll open something up different. I mean, do you understand the, the undergirding you have to have to say no to something that is naturally very attractive to you? Even someone you may love, your, your desire, you want to be married to them, whatever it might be, and you just feel that check of the Spirit that says, this is, this is not right, this is not the one. And you can say, well, Lord, I check all the boxes. And I mean, you, you learn to discern that. If not, you reap the rewards that are not good in your life. So this communion with the Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary for us to have the free reign and the success that God's called us to in life. You know, that, that Holy Spirit relationship uh, is challenged at times by our own sin. I wish I had more time to go into this. Maybe I will next week. But when you start to get your life involved in patterns of sin, even as a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, whether it be some of the big sins we think about, you know, fornication, adultery, or anger, gossip, slander, even those things. When that becomes a part of your personal soul infrastructure, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible is very clear on that. It says that in numerous uh, places throughout the Scripture. And David, as we know, got involved in an adulterous relationship. He just kept disregarding the voice of the Lord, plowed through with what he wanted and when he came to a point in desperation, Psalm 51 was written where he says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. See, he's understanding. The man after God's own heart understands separation can take place. The communication lines can be cut between you and the Holy Spirit because of our own choices, our own sin, our own passion to justify what we know is wrong. Do not cast me away from your presence. Listen to this. This is what's important in his mind. In the Old Testament, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I can't live without the Holy Spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. That's our cry to the Lord. That's our passion for the Lord. I'll close with this. Joseph, the the father, earthly father of Jesus. We don't know much about him, but I've, I, this is normally something I'd talk about at Christmas time. But all that we know about Joseph is that he was going to marry Mary, finds out she's pregnant, and is ready to, what the Bible calls, put her away, or it's a separation, uh, uh, a pre premarriage separation, saying, uh, because this woman has been with another man, we will not get married. But the Holy Spirit shows up in the dream and says, this child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. I mean, it took a dream for him to be convinced of that. And so he married her. He went with that dream. It turns out there's four dreams that Joseph has to, to marry Mary, even though she's pregnant. Do you understand the ramifications of that? As a man or a woman, I'm gonna marry someone that in the natural and societal look has been with another man, but I'm believing that she has not been with another man, but actually this is the seed of the Holy Spirit that's put within her. What? 
yeah, I'm changing my life. I'm making directions and decisions because of that. Number two, the baby is born. Holy Spirit comes to him in a dream again and says, escape to Egypt. What? Holy Spirit, why would he tell me to escape? We'll, we'll stand with this child. No, chi no harm is going to come to this child. I'm going to stand right here. Herod is going to collapse because of this child. I'm going to stand in faith and believe it. Yeah, okay. Okay, but the Holy Spirit says, no, no, we want to move you over to Egypt. Do you understand that sometimes God moves you for your protection? Sometimes he shifts you. Even though you say, well, I'm going to fight this out. Some things you're not supposed to fight. Some things you're supposed to avoid. Because the Spirit will show you. Once you get a revelation of that, it's not just simple religious answers. You did this, that's not God. You do this, that's not God. This is God. That's not God. We hear it all over the place. I'm telling you, commune with the Holy Spirit. It's not about your feelings. It's about that gut understanding of communing with the Holy Spirit, knowing His ways, and making the choices like Apostle Paul, like Jesus, like you. He goes to Egypt a few years. Holy Spirit comes and says, it's time to go back. Another dream. He heads back. I mean, he's totally led by dreams. Four times. That's all we know about Joseph. He starts to go back where the baby was born in Bethlehem, Jerusalem area. I've been there. You know, I know where he probably was. He's going back over there. And then the Holy Spirit warns him in a dream. It says, don't go back there because they're still seeking you. Go up to the north. So he goes up to Nazareth and they settle there, of course, to raise their new son, Jesus. Led by the Spirit of God. Where are you? Is the Holy Spirit leading you? Is the Holy Spirit guiding you? Sorry I'm going a little bit over, but I'm online only today, so I guess I can do that. Let's just take a minute, though, wherever you are, just kind of wait in the presence of the Lord. Are you communing with the Holy Spirit? Two places in the New Testament. The communion of the Holy Spirit. What does that even look like? What does it mean? Relationship, koinonia, closeness. You get to a situation where you say, Holy Spirit, I don't know what to do. I'll never forget when we bought our house here in Brunswick. We were fresh from Canada, 10 years in Canada, came back. Really no money. The money we had was Canadian money, which was not worth as much as U.S. money. I didn't have a job. We were going to start a church. They turned me down initially for a loan, but I found a house that a friend of mine had just built. And he said, look, I can sell this to you. I'll give you a deal, all this kind of stuff. So we went in the backyard. I'm here, I'm 39 years old at that time, 39 years old. Stood in the backyard, bare ground. There's no grass or anything yet, no deck out there. It's a brand new house. No carpet on the floor, nothing. We toured it, thought, wow, this is my dream home. This would be a great place to raise my kids in. Got a little lake in the backyard. There was a park nearby. It was amazing, you know. I thought this is beyond me, but I had friends, fortunately, that were hearing clearer than me. <laughs> they said, let's claim this in Jesus' name. Well, I don't, man, I don't, I mean, I believe in claiming and everything, but I don't, I don't know. This is like, I don't want to get myself in a bind. I don't want to become a financial situation, you know, but, but I agreed with them. We, we stood out in the backyard of a place I did not own yet. It was barren. It was going to need a lot of money still to get it up to being in the neighborhood, you know. It was way beyond anything that I owned in Canada. It was 50% it was more than what I had in Canada. So I'm like, Jesus, this is, and I don't even have a job, Lord. I'm, I'm depending on a church growing. I mean, you can't imagine. I've got four children. I'm married. You know, what are we going to do? I, I'm responsible for this. But when we prayed in the back, something clicked in my soul, even though it was an impossibility. It was the Holy Spirit saying, this is good. Go ahead and claim it. So I spoke those things which are not as though they were. That's what you do in the Spirit. And within days, they called me back and said, look, we had a meeting. Whoever decides these things, the bank. And they said, uh, you know, your numbers don't come up to where they need to be. But someone on the team, the banker's team said, let's give this minister a shot. Let's, let's, let's loan him the money. They loaned me the money. We've been living there now for 24 years, raised my kids there. So, you know, it's just been an awesome homestead for us, and we're so thankful for it. Learning the communion. I wish I got it every time, but I don't. When I dreamed that this week, I thought, Lord, I want to live in that place <laughs> where everything, the favor of God, it's different, to this, but it's just all you feel because you're moving in the Spirit. It's living a favored life, 
of being led by the fire and by the cloud. So as we just wait, I don't know what you're facing right now, but let me just speak into it. Let's do a little activation. Let's just say, Holy Spirit, come. Come into my life right now. Let him do it wherever you are right now. He's here in this room, I can tell you that. Come. Holy Spirit. <laughs> I know we're late. It's 12.07. You don't have to eat until 12.30. Just wait a few moments. Ephesians 5 says this. If you were once darkness, but now you're the light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of of the Spirit. I'm saying that clearly because fruit of the Spirit is a little word we get and we just swear we think we know what it means. But the fruit, in other words, the things that come out of a life in the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That is the life in the Spirit. Like, Lord, woo-hoo. A lot of things you just decide on, you know, I don't know that the Lord really is concerned whether you have an Americano or a latte or a cappuccino or whatever. Get whatever you want. But there are certain things in life you're going to say, Holy Spirit, I'm coming up to a bend in the road here. Lead me, Holy Spirit. He wants to show you. Jesus said he would show you all things pertaining to him. It's interesting in Galatians Galatians 5, 16, it says this. I say this, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Ephesians 4, 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Jesus. Oh, lead us, Lord. May your Holy Spirit unpack everything we need to know about heaven. We invite you, Holy Spirit, right now to mess with people's souls. Everyone watching this right now, you invite the Holy Spirit in, He will mess with your soul. You'll get clarity that is otherworldly and so powerful. It's like, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? Buying a house? Holy Spirit. Wanting to marry that woman? She's not serving God. She's far from God, doesn't want to believe in God. But boy, I feel so attached to her. Follow the principles of the Holy Spirit. I know it's difficult. This would be the short round, Lord, right here. We feel it's right with one another, but it's not following with purposes of God for your life. And so you have to say, no, I'm going I'm to go in a different direction. Why didn't you marry that woman? It's, Holy Spirit, it's taking me somewhere else. When you finally get with that man or that woman that God calls you to marry, you're going to realize, whoa, thank you, Jesus, that I waited. Thank you, Lord, I waited for this job. Thank you, you waited for this look. Thank you, Lord, that I heard your voice. These things shape the entire outcomes of my life. Holy Spirit, I need you. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, you're watching online, you're listening to it or whatever, you, you may not even understand totally what I'm talking about. But let me just tell you this, God wants to guide you into the most preferred destiny that you could ever imagine in your entire life. If you've not received Jesus Christ into your life, I encourage you right now to what the Bible says, repent. In other words, you turn, you turn from where you've been going and you yield your life fully to Jesus Christ. When you do that, he assigns the Holy Spirit to you. It is sealed. The Bible says you're born of the Spirit. And now your life is one of running after God, learning His ways, and having the best life. It's still going to be difficulties, but the favor of God that's upon you as the Spirit of God is leading you is overwhelming. And so right now, if you do not know what that's about, you say, man, I I want that. I want to walk in that way. Right now, you just ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. That's simple. You say, well, what are the words? You You don't need fancy words or anything. All you have to do is share from your heart and say, Jesus, I need you. I believe that you died for me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord, of all my sin and all the weights that are in me, Lord, that I might walk in your ways. And if you do that right now, according to the Word of God, in John chapter 3, you are born again. I'm not sure if we can get that slide up here that gives us a text number that they can text. 
And we've got some training courses you can go through online. All you do is text to this number. Give us your name and email address. Do we have that? Yeah, there we go. It's up there. I have decided. You text that number, name, email. You'll be in touch with us. You'll be to watch some videos. It's time to grow in Jesus Christ and see the Lord impact these decisions of your life. Hey, we bless you. This is Steve Witt for Bethel Cleveland. See you next week live in person at the 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, and 6 o'clock at Bethel Cleveland campuses. Go on BethelCleveland.com. Thank you for watching us on YouTube. This will be our home going forward. We'd love to see you live and in person if possible. Come see us. God bless. Have a great week.